Hello, everyone. So this week is uh, class seven, and we're going to talk about environmental storytelling and uh, theme parks and reward spaces. So there we go. Uh, from the syllabus, um, to break it down, we are going to talk about the, uh, in class, the recommended reading, which is chapter nine on theme patterns. Um, again, I, I strongly recommend at least reading the intro to this section because uh, it's going to lay out some more theory than I will talk about either in class or here on how theme patterns work and what you want to do with that. Um, then we're going to talk about architectural approach to level design chapter seven, which is rewards and game spaces. So I have a number of questions for you around that. Um, and then you will also talk about the uh, game design patterns that you, or sorry, not game design patterns, the architectural patterns you pick from a pattern language and, um, and discuss how those apply to games. Uh, if we have time for that. And then uh, lecture topics this week are going to be environmental narrative and storytelling um, and lessons from theme park design, uh, evocative spaces is what those are often called. We're in class going to review the project designs as usual, and we are going to do exercise 16, which is creating a themed pattern. Um, and then we will um, also talk a little bit about challenge four, which is an emergent pattern, another thing you can do for extra credit. And our projects this week are going to be to create a scene using the pattern we derive in exercise 16, noting any elements from chapter seven uh, that you use as part of your design. So environmental storytelling. Um, we hear and see this a lot, and there's some great examples of it. Um, but what is the reason for and the sort of mechanical function of environmental storytelling? Why would we do it? Um, so push versus pull in narrative construction um, are there's different ways that you can convey narrative. Um, one of those ways is push. You can um, push narrative onto the user. So if I'm telling you a story verbally, that's push. You're just sitting there and listening. I'm pushing story at you. Um, if you read a book, that is push narrative. That narrative is being pushed onto the page by the author where you're consuming it. Um, it can have the feel a little bit of pull because um, I'm, I'm actively engaging with um, bringing that uh, meaning to myself. So it can feel a little bit different. Um, or in, you know, in movies or in cutscenes, we're pushing narrative at the player. Um, pull narrative is narrative that you have to actively engage in. So you get a little bit of that in reading. Um, you get a lot of that in uh, game design as I'm playing through the game. Um, I have to do something to cause the story to advance. So even if it's being given to me via cutscenes or, or um, that kind of thing, there's, there's a degree of pull. If it's being given to me through the like mechanical progress of the game, then that's pull. I'm having to actively engage with those mechanics to generate the narrative. Um, and if I'm experiencing environmental narrative, then I'm constructing that, uh, that meaning and narrative context uh, myself as I progress through the environment. So I'm generating it, it's pull. Um, so environmental narrative can only show things, right? They say, you know, show, don't tell. Well, in environmental narrative, all you can do is show. You're not doing anything, you're just showing something. Um, the power of cutscenes and um, push narrative in general is that you have creative control over it. I control what I push to you through my cutscene, through my movie, through my book, right? Like I'm putting that in, in, into you and there's not um, a whole lot of, of different po uh, interpretation possible uh, or different experience possible given that I'm directly pushing it to you. Obviously your background and what you bring to the viewing and your understanding and interpretation of the symbols uh, shift what the meaning is, but uh, I can control at least what you're going to see. Um, so I have a lot of creative control over that kind of experience. Um, so the power of gameplay is in the doing, right? So if, if the narrative is being um, given to you through gameplay, you know, the story is about a knight who goes into the wilderness and slays the monster and like, I start the game and I'm a knight and I go into the wilderness and I slay the monster. I've experienced that narrative and I, you know, actuated that, right? I do it. Um, 
I've talked about how games always have meaning, that games are rhetoric that you play, um, where games are an argument that the designer is making and communicating through to you through their mechanics and level design, and you are experiencing that argument by participating in it. So that's where gameplay is powerful. Um, but the power of environmental storytelling is in what you can't do or you can't show. So in, if you have environmental narrative, um, then you're not giving the player all the pieces. You're giving them uh, evidence and they're constructing that evidence into narrative themselves. They're imagining what happened here, right? They see um, some circumstance and they have to imagine what what uh, what there is that has happened. Um, in the terms that we've been talking about in the last few weeks, right? Um, push narrative, even gameplay are positive space. They're things that the player does. They're things that the, um, that the game designer does that have positive narrative space. And environmental storytelling is sort of negative narrative space. The objects and the evidence that you present to the player are there but the story that's constructed isn't. The players are filling in that negative space with their imagination of what must have happened. And that can be really powerful um, for a couple of reasons. One, often our imaginations are better than a game engine at creating a, a particular scenario. Um, and sometimes really explicitly, our game engine can't do that thing that we want the player to imagine. So if I have a, um, you know, a third person action game and I want the player to run into town and uh, discover that the town has been destroyed by a dragon, um, but my engine does not support flying enemies and like the destruction of buildings and like all of the mechanical stuff that would be necessary to present being there while the dragon destroys the town, um, you know, I show the shadow of a dragon passing over the ground towards the town before I come around the corner and I get to the town and the town is burning and in flames. Um, and, you know, I talk to different NPCs and they describe the events that happened to them or I, you know, see in the ravaged town and the dead um, villagers and whatever. I construct the narrative of what happened in this town um, in this vivid way, but it's not actually in the game engine. And, and the developers didn't have the budget or the time to implement a bunch of mechanics just to create that one scene. Um, and, and often what the players can produce in their mind may even be better than, uh, than what I could have done or what I had the budget or resources to do. So um, sometimes that constraint of what my limits are really can um, cause me to use environmental storytelling to fill things in and create a much richer story than uh, and a much better experience for the player than what they would have had if they actually watched that thing happen. Um, I have linked to two up above uh, to two. Actually, it's probably that that way. There we go. Uh, I imagine my my window is over there. So. Um, the GDC Fault lecture that is linked here, uh, I linked to both the audio and the slides, the sort of combined lecture with the um, you know, picture in picture of the speaker was behind paywall last time I checked, but the audio and the slides are free. So I recommend bringing both of those up and listening. Um, there's a lot of really good uh, information in there. They talk about Bioshock, they talk about a lot of different big industry games. Um, and how you go about doing environmental storytelling, how you'd want to construct it. So some good practical advice. Um, I recommend listening to that lecture if you can. Um, you know, if you can't, don't, but uh, it is worth your time and you will be more prepared in class. I will even ask if anyone listened to it and, you know, um, give you brownie points, if nothing else, uh, if someone can tell me about that lecture. All right. So an example of environmental storytelling. Um, Doing simple environmental storytelling is pretty easy. You see it in a lot of games, right? If you imagine Skyrim, you walk into a, uh, a house and there's food on the table. Simple environmental storytelling. We have created a house. We put food on a table. The player walks in and they don't say, ah, look at this house where a developer put food on the table. They say, ah, look at this house. People live here and they were eating dinner. They've left. I wonder where they went. Is their food eaten or not? Like, 
I wonder if they were driven off by monsters or like, have they, you know, are they wasteful? Is this food spoiled? Are they about to come in and be like, why are you in my house? Like we have all of these thoughts about the situation. That's easy environmental storytelling, right? You come into a clearing and there's a, you know, dead body and monster, monster footprints going away. Oh goodness, the monster must've killed this guy and it went that way. Environmental storytelling, awesome. Pretty simple though doing subtle environmental storytelling, and it can be really powerful for doing this kind of thing, is harder. Um, so imagine that same, um, that same scene in Skyrim. You come into a house and there's um, two places that are set with food on them. And there's, no, there's a third place with a high chair and no food. And there's some toys scattered around the floor. Um, I say, okay, so, there's two places set and the child wasn't being fed. Like, do, did they send their child to bed with no food? Did, did their child die? And like, you know, so they don't need to cook for them anymore. Is, it, is the baby too young to be being served food? Maybe that's all it is. But I wonder about that because that's kind of weird. You know, there's these toys, but there's no, there's no place setting, no evidence of the child being right now present. And then later I go upstairs and, you know, I see the, um, a room with a child's bed and some toys scattered around and their food is on the floor in their room. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder what happened that the child was being fed dinner in their room. Like, were they bad? Is there something wrong with them? Were they sick and they were being brought bed, brought food in bed? Um, you know, I'm, I'm starting to construct a much more nuanced, complicated narrative about the people in this house and what their lives are like. Um, and that starts to get more powerful, right? Like, oh, hey, they ate food. Sure, environmental narrative, boring. There's some weird thing going on with their kid, way more interesting. And now I want those details. I want to find out about it. You know, now maybe I do something, uh, some poor bit of embedded narrative. We'll talk about that in a minute um, and leave a note about what happened, um, you know, that you find out later and there's, there's payoff, there's reward for wondering about that thing. So again, you know, what can't you script what don't you have the time to script? What wouldn't work very well in terms of gameplay, right? If I walk in and there's like this whole family drama going on, I'm like, I'm a monster hunter. I'm not here to engage with you all and watch you eat dinner um, and watch you send your kid to, to bed. But if I can explore that space at my own pace, then I may pick up all of that story and engage with it in a way that I wouldn't if you tried to push it at me. So environmental storytelling can be sophisticated uh, and wonderful if you really think it through and leave the player multiple paths of clues, right? In case they miss one. All right, so non-environmental narrative. I said this just a second ago, embedded narrative. What do I mean by embedded narrative? Like that sounds like I'm embedding narrative in the world. That sounds like environmental narrative. Why is it different? Um, this is a distinction that I came across. I think it's useful. It's not universally accepted. You could consider both of these things, types of environmental narrative, and that's fine. But I, I think this, this nuance is interesting. Um, embedded narrative is narrative that is intrinsic to the game world, that is intentionally created by those that exist in the game world for those that exist within the game world. Now, that being said, when we make games, everything in the game is generated by the developer and everything in the game is intended for the player. But within the fiction of the game world, um, environmental narrative is things that happen in the game world that my player or character interpret. And embedded narrative is narrative that is intentionally created by those in the game world to be perceived by those in the game world. So an example for, of that would be if there is an audio log that you find when you're exploring a abandoned spaceship, that is embedded narrative. The character that left the audio log left that audio log either for their, you know, fiance or their captain or like the person who might come along and actually um, pay attention to to the fact that their ship has been destroyed by aliens and, and wants to know what happened. Um, incidentally, the player is also getting that narrative, but it's aimed at someone in the game world. Um, another example in the real world would be you know, a uh, mural on a church wall or mural in stained glass, right? Telling the story of, um, of a particular religious occurrence or, or historical occurrence. Um, that 
is something that the person who built the church put that narrative onto the wall for people who came into the church to experience. That is embedded narrative. Environmental narrative would be something like, I come into the church and I notice that the um, bars for kneeling on are threadbare and the stuffing's coming out, that there's graffiti carved onto the back of um, the pews and like bubblegum stuck to the hymnal. Um, that tells a different environmental story about the kind of people who are coming here to worship, the state of their faith, the, you know, the, the nature of this church and the people who attend it. But that's not a story that's being intentionally told to anyone. That's just the result of being in the world for those people. So as I'm creating as a developer a level, um, and I'm, in, I'm putting narrative into the level for the player to experience, I should think about are these things that I'm doing things that people in the world are creating for other people in the world? That's a valid way of conveying narrative and especially conveying very explicit narrative. Or am I putting out clues for the player and possibly character to interpret, to generate stories? That's environmental narrative. Um, it's a subtle distinction, and, but it's one that I find useful. So, um, when you are thinking about um, non-environmental narrative, um, when you're thinking about how you're building your game world, what's your starting point? Um, how are you constructing the world? And this was the mention of the idea that Tolkien built um, his world based on language. His starting point for constructing all the layers of meaning of, of environmental narrative in his story was language. He then asked, what kind of a place would be would it be where people speak this elvish language what given given what i know about linguistics and how languages are constructed what is the environment that generates a people who speak this language right um he started from those linguistic roots and built his world based on the languages um because he was a linguist that was his background you might be an artist and you might say i'm going to paint this scene what kind of a people, what kind of a culture would exist in this scene? What kind of language would they speak? What kind of activities would they do? Um, so as you're building out the world, you can have any different starting point that is facilitated by your background, but you need to think around all of the other possibilities when you're fleshing out that environment and creating the you know, textured story of that world. Um, so pick your starting point, work outward from there. Um, Let's see, narrative context redefining the meaning of a mechanic. Um, so in this case, uh, if you think of, oh goodness, um, running, if your narrative context is this is a, uh, a game about the Olympics and you are you know, training to run as quickly as you can and leveling up your character to be able to compete in some competition, um, you know, then the meaning of running is about striving for something great and, you know, running faster or more slowly is about like your success and the, your pride in your, you know, your in-group, whatever it is. If you're making a story that is about being chased by terrifying monsters that want to eat you, then the meaning of running is about, you know, escaping um, doom, about, you know, fleeing towards freedom. That same mechanic of this is a game about running has very different meanings based on the context. Um, space is the same kind of thing. If you make a game that is about, um, you know, being um, committed to prison and trying to escape, you know, it's a great escape kind of prison caper or like, you know, a slice of life about how horrible it is to actually be in prison because it's awful. Um, and, and so you're making a game about that. It's about being in prison. You might have that same environment and use it in a, you know, a scene from The Walking Dead where the survivors are taking refuge in the prison because it was built, you know, to keep things in or out. And uh, it's a great place to be defended from or be defend yourself from zombies, but also maybe you're getting trapped by zombies. And that has a very different feel to all of those spaces because of the different narrative context. Um, emergent narrative is where the player is bringing the meeting, meaning where you're providing them with a number of different um, elements and they are combining those elements to generate meaning based on their play of a game. 
Um, if you read the Three Pillars of Emergent Narrative pattern in the pattern library, it talks about what things you need to provide to players so that those emergent experiences can be meaningful. Um, because if you, you call it a emergent experience when you randomly spawn, spawn monsters into the game world and the player wandering through the game world has to fight the monsters and hey, they're having emergent battles, those battles have no context, they have no motivation, they have no repercussions on the game world, they have very little meaning to the player. Uh, what do you need to add to, um, to the mix if there's a emergent narrative to allow the players to create meaning? Again, Three Pillars of Emergent Meaning talks about one idea of what you might want to add. Um, and then player defined stories um, are our emergent narrative uh, and what kind of stories the players tell are going to be based on both the mechanics of the game and what kind of game space is created. So, you know, if you create a lot of battle arenas and uh, you spawn, you have a lot of monsters in the world and a lot of combat mechanics, the stories that players tell about your game, the stories that emerge from that gameplay are going to be all about fighting things. Um, if you have a game that has a lot of complex dialogue and morality options and choice-based gameplay, this kind of stories that are generated by that gameplay are going to be about what kind of choices you make. So those kind of emergent stories that happen within your, uh, your game are going to be defined by how you build the game, even if they're things that emerge based on player behavior. Cool. All right, uh, theme park design versus uh, theme park games. Um, we really wanna talk about theme park design, but, but really quickly, um, when I say a theme park game, um, I don't really mean a sim or building game that's about creating a theme park. That's a dumb thing to have to say, but there's like a dozen different, you know, roller coaster tycoon, all of those kind of things that are about building theme parks. That's mostly not what I'm talking about here. A theme park game would be, a game where um, there are many different large set pieces, thematically constructed areas, and the player has, you know, can maybe choose which area to go to to engage with, what parts of that theme and thematic interaction they want to um, participate in. <clears throat> but um, but uh, it's all largely constructed by the developer for the player to explore and sort of ride the tram around the theme park and run into all of these different themes and events, um, you know, and, and giving them more choice about when and how to, to create those things, but within limited uh, focused environments, largely focused on creating um, thematic, powerful set piece kind of uh, situations. So those are theme park game. When I say theme park design, I don't mean designing a theme park game. I mean literally designing an actual theme park. Um, you might say, well, but theme parks aren't games, uh, Professor. Why, why would I spend time studying building something that's not a game? Um, and the answer is that um, theme parks are really expensive to build. And they're probably the constructed, physical constructed space that most closely resembles a game. Um, and the amount of money put into them is far higher than that put into any other constructed space. I mean, you could argue that like escape rooms are physical spaces that are game related. Um, even sports stadiums are physical spaces that are game related. But um, the kind of narrative or interactive games that we create with complicated stories and, and um, very targeted thematic uh, construction are, are most closely related to theme parks. Um, and if you have, if you build a theme park and you spend hundreds of millions of dollars um, building Tomorrowland or Frontierland or the new Star Wars attraction for, you know, for Disneyland or the new Looney Tunes attraction for um, the Six Flags uh, franchise, then um, once you've built it, it's really expensive to change it because you physically constructed all of this custom space to create an event and, or to create an experience. And if you did that wrong, then you're sort of out of luck. Uh, you just, you got that space and now you got to deal with it. So before people build theme parks, they really carefully think about where they're going to put a wall. If you put a wall in the wrong place in a game, you know, it's not like there's no overhead to moving it, but you just move the wall. And you're like, okay, well, let's, let's try deleting that and building a different one. Let's scrap the level and build again. It doesn't take, it takes some time, but it doesn't really take resources beyond time to, to construct that space. 
Um, so the, the thought that's gone into theme park design is very reasoned and very nuanced and very specific and very validated. Um, so you, a lot of the, the basic ideas we've talked about like architectural weenies and all of those kind of things that came from the Imagineering team in Disney, um, you know, those are all things that were created for theme parks um, and very carefully validated and have been borne out by decades of visitors to the park behaving in the way that's expected. Um, so there are a lot of different kinds of, uh, of elements that you see in theme parks. Some of them um, are architectural weenies. Another is the idea of a berm, which is to say putting a hill between one area and the next to break the sight lines of users from that area and the next area. So if you have Frontierland here and Tomorrowland there, then you put a little hill between them so that you can't see one from the other. Um, but you can see architectural weenies from them, so you know how to get between them. But mostly the area, everything I can see from where I am is consistent with the theme of the area I'm in. And then you, you round a corner and you leave visibility of one area and you move to visibility of another area. These transitions are actually pretty similar to the kind of um, hallways that they use to, uh, to hide loading screens, where you're moving from one set of assets to another through a, a limited space. Um, and moving from one set of sight lines to another. So sight lines. Iconic structures are similar to architectural weenies, but aren't necessarily larger for navigation, but their particular building structures or styles that allow you to very easily identify, ah, this space is, um, you know, has this theme, this is its purpose. I recognize that's a saloon in Frontierland. I recognize that's a spaceport in Tomorrowland. Like those, those structures are iconic, though they're meant to be seen in a more compressed area. There are lots and lots of those. Uh, I linked to the theme park design book, which lists a ton of them um, and is a sort of practical guide to those kind of techniques. If you are getting into a career in level design, you probably having a copy of that on your desk to refer to is a pretty good idea. All right. And lastly, uh, what is a theme? So just to be clear, when we're talking about theme, I've been saying it a bunch and we're about to do an exercise based on it. Uh, theme can mean different things. As a noun, uh, a theme is an idea that recurs uh, or pervades a work of art or literature. So that is the, the classical style of the theme of man versus nature in this game, the theme of man versus man, the theme of you know, the, the eternal ineffability of loss or, or whatever. Um, you know, those are our themes. Um, but also to theme something as a verb is to give it a particular setting or ambiance. So if I say, take this game and give it a Wild West theme, I'm not saying give it a theme, in, probably, I'm not saying give it a theme about the exploitation of um, indigenous peoples and about the like uh, greed and avarice of the um, uh, expansionist uh, period in American uh, history, right? I'm probably talking about, I'd like to see cowboys, and I'd like to see stagecoaches, and I'd like to see train robberies, like give me Red Dead Redemption. Um, so theming, I'm give it a fantasy theme, give it a sci-fi theme, give it a post-apocalyptic theme. Um, you may very well be giving it both a literary noun type theme and a shallow verb type theme that are in concordance with each other, and that's going to be even more powerful. But recognize that, that there's two different things there and that they aren't, they aren't the same, they aren't talking about the same thing. All right, just to wrap this up, um, we're gonna do show and tell next, and then we will uh, talk about the readings and discussion. Um, again, uh, glance down at the uh, presenter notes below this slide because I talk about, uh, you know, I, I hint at some of the answers that I'm hoping to get for these things. This is also gonna involve, involve a little, um, a little writing exercise and then answering questions to that, more analysis. Um, you can't just uh, regurgitate what I said in the lecture. And then um, we're gonna do exercise 16, which is the theme pattern. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you go through that process. Again, um, you know, look in the Pattern Language for Game Design book to uh, read about how I did this pattern. And you'll find the results of, of my application of the pattern in uh, at that link on exercise 231, or sorry, pattern 231. Um, 
Also, if you need extra credit and you're interested, um, the exercise that I did to get the three patterns of emergent narrative that I mentioned is this um, you know, challenge for emergent narrative pattern. So if you would like to think about emergent narrative, um, this is another advanced pattern. It's hard. You're not required to do it as undergrads. But if you want to get more out of the class, here it is. All right. Um, and then your assignments, you know, write a paragraph for each of your readings. Uh, they're all listed there. Um, your finish up your pattern for exercise 16, enter it into the pattern library, use the results in creating the, um, the scene that you're going to create for this week uh, based on environmental narrative, uh, environmental storytelling, embedded narrative, right? All these things. Um, and then um, you are going to, well, no. So the grad students have to pick at least one challenge pattern um, uh, from their group to incorporate. Uh, you don't have to do that. However, if any members of your group do create um, a challenge pattern and you do incorporate it, your whole group will get extra credit for that. So it might be worth it if you have one um, go-getter in your, in your group to have them do this extra pattern and incorporate it and mention that and uh, reap the benefits for your whole group. All right, I will see you all in class either tomorrow or on Thursday.